It's Monday, August 19th. I'm Adam Walsh, and this is The Signal. Today on the show, it's a farming conversation centered around young farmers and mentorship. You'll hear from farmers across the province on why they got into the profession, how it's going, and how to grow their ranks. And I am back uh, from a week off, so thanks to Bernice Hillier and Amanda Gear for a great week of programming last uh, week while I was away. Today's show on young farmers, uh, the idea for today's show, like we we cover food security, we, we cover farming here on The Signal, but uh, the idea for today's show came from a caller who called The Signal Line, and then uh, I called said person back, and we had a, a chat, and the caller mentioned how obviously important farming is in Newfoundland and Labrador, and this time of us talking about food security and the need to grow more of our own here in this province, the caller asked for a show that focuses on young farmers. So that's how we got here. And simply put, we can't grow more of our own without people interested in doing the growing. So let's find out who's doing some of the growing and how to get more folks into growing more and uh, to grow better. To start with that, well, I've got a couple of people here in the studio. I'll say quickly hi to them, and then I'll go to the phones. We've got Krista Chapman, uh, Three Mile Ridge uh, Farm, and uh, Matt Morey, Heritage Farm. How are you both doing? Good. Great. So it's. I'm looking out uh, the window. It's raining. Uh, yeah, this is good. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I just wanted to check. I was like, that feels like a good thing, given yeah. the dry weather. Mm-hmm. All right. Rain is good, folks. Let me go to the phones. we got Mark Hoff on the line, Outreach Coordinator, NL Young Farmers. How you doing? Good, Adam. Thank you. How are you? Good, man. Thanks for helping us uh, get this show together today. I appreciate all the help with it from the, the random email I sent you. Uh, tell us and tell everyone about NL Young Farmers. Yeah, and all young farmers. It's a nonprofit uh, organization. We work in association with the Newfoundland and Labrador Federation of Agriculture. So basically, what we do is we support young farmers age 18 to 40 across Newfoundland and Labrador, and we provide uh, informational resources. We provide workshops, uh, training sessions, and also networking opportunities uh, with either with other young farmers, or uh, we'll connect uh, young farmers with pe- with uh, the proper people in. The the uh, industry, whether that be um, uh, government uh, officials who can help people get into the industry or, or other farmers who can help uh, less experienced farmers come into the industry. Obviously, with Krista and Jonathan, that's the case. Um, so, yeah, we also are run by a, uh, well, we consult with a steering committee, and that's made up of a number of uh, uh, farmers across the province and also some government uh, officials on there just to make sure that uh, the uh, programming and uh, workshops and sessions that we are offering are relevant and uh, what people want to see and participate in. What kind of a time is this to get into to farming if you're a young farmer who's interested for Newfoundland and Labrador? I think it's a wonderful time. There's certainly a, a growth. I think uh, the uh, COVID pandemic certainly uh, showed people uh, how fragile our food systems can be. So uh, I think the, so ever since then, people have paid a lot more attention to uh, farming and growing food across the province and how vital that is if we want to maintain a sustainable and profitable agriculture industry here. Um, there's certainly a lot of government support out there for people who wanted to get into farming. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a wonderful time. And you see a burgeoning of uh, farm, like uh, farmers markets across the province. The new one just opened up in uh, Norris Arm out in Central. So, you know, it's a, it's a great time to uh, to uh, get into it and to try to connect with uh, other people in the industry. Yeah, There's a leadership summit coming up the fall, right? Can you tell us about it? Yeah, for sure. Uh, That's our annual leadership summit. This is the 11th annual. Uh, It's scheduled for October 18th to the 19th in Deer Lake. It'll be held at the Deer Lake Motel. So it's a a two-day summit. Uh, Day one is basically the NL Young Farmers portion of it. Um, So we have a a great lineup of uh, speakers. Uh, We'll be focused. Well, the theme of the uh, summit this year is the cost of farming. So our, all of our sessions will revolve around that theme, and we have a uh, great lineup discussing farm business planning, uh, like land acquisition, so crown land versus private land, lease versus buy, 
uh, incorporation versus sole proprietorship. How do you want to organize your business? Um, financing and funding opportunities. Uh, Farm business marketing, and uh, we'll also have a, a keynote speaker with Dan Rubin from uh, the uh, Food Producers Forum. Dan Rubin, good friend of the show, a regular, regular guest for gardening and also food producer stuff. So uh, he's a great guest for you to have. Mark, uh, we're going to uh, put you on pause and then call you back uh, towards the end of the show to see if there's anything we missed or if there's anything you want to expand on, if that works for you. Sounds great. Thank you, Adam. All right. Thanks, Mark. Mark Hoff, their outreach coordinator in L. Young Farmers. So let's now go to the folks in studio. Uh, you know, Chris and Matt, what kind, what kind of a time is it in Newfoundland and Labrador if you're a young farmer getting into the biz? I think it depends on what you're starting off with. Yeah. So if you have an alder bed that you want to farm, you got challenges ahead of you. But if you got a lawn, mm. it's a bit easier. Yeah. It depends what you're getting into. Yeah. And the scale, you mm. can grow a lot of stuff in a small area. Yeah. Matt? Yeah, no, no doubt. Uh, I think Mark uh, made a good point there about COVID and food security. Uh, I think that did bring a lot of attention to the fact that there's not much being, or not, not that there's not much being grown on the island, but we certainly could, uh, you know, improve. Um, it, it, I, in my opinion, I think it is a, a reasonably good time to get into farming. Uh, mm. There, there are new challenges, but at the same time, there's a lot of good opportunities within the province, mm. um, whether it's through government subsidies and grants and that sort of thing or land acquisition. And there's a lot of committees and, and not-for-profits that are willing to help out with uh, with your journey. It I has been interesting. Sorry, good. go ahead. I think we have a lot of support, which is great. Yeah, it has been interesting with, is a, you know... Um, Mark mentioned uh, Dan Rubin, right, and Food Producers Forum. And we've had Dan on a fair bit, and we've had others on talking about a lot of it, too. It's, it's the realization of the of, of food security, of where the food our food is coming from. There seems to be more thought around that now, which seems to be good for farmers if you're in the business where people – wondering more and in caring more about where their product comes from. Let's talk about your individual farms and uh, and just kind of like what, uh, how you got into it and um, and how it's going. Kristen, what were you? So I grew up on the farm that I now <laughs> operate. It's a good so, way to get into it. <laughs> yeah, I've been falling asleep in the tractor since I was two. I uh, learned how to drive it at four. Um, so did my sons. Um, so farming was my way of life. And it's what I grew up knowing. So William Reeder owned the farm originally. Um, my dad decided he wanted to do mechanics, so he just farmed for us. Um, he just fed us all winter with what he farmed. And then I went to university, did child psychology, and decided I wanted to go on the fields with my children. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, helped take care of my grandparents and took over the farm. Uh, it was grown in. 30 feet on the ram for sure, because it was lying dormant for 30 to 40 years. Wow. Yeah, and I I started pushing back uh, ground that my grandfather once plowed. I started on one acre, and we're, we've met, we're managing 81 acres plus an acre plot up in Carnival, and we are growing 25 acres on rotation in veg. What types, so with veg, what types of crops then like for the veg? It's easier to say what we don't grow. <laughs> we grow a lot. Well, we, you know, your basic jigs dinner, like everybody loves, a lot of carrot, cabbage, different varieties of each. So you got your early, your mid-season, and your late, so you can put it in storage. And I like to grow purple everything. Okay. Because you can get purple everything. Even Brussels sprouts, purple. Oh. Broccoli, that's purple. Carrots, that's purple peppers that's purple why why do you like i don't know you just like it yeah i, I guess I mean, because I'm my grandmother it, it once sounds... said to me you can't <laughs> you're like yes you can yes you can and it sounds yeah. beautiful right yeah like that, and that we much used color. to have a customer had a little girl that used to come into the store and the only thing she ate was purple veg <laughs> so you know getting purple cauliflower into her was easy wow yeah so we i we grow a lot even from cantaloupe honeydew watermelon uh, this year, my new vegetable to try was artichoke. How is that? It's growing. It's stabby. Yeah. Yeah, it's growing. I haven't. I don't see an artichoke yet, but it, the plants are pretty big. Wow. Yeah. 
uh, artichoke heart. I mean, I love artichoke heart. So to have fresh, I like that's an interesting. Yeah, I hope we get to the fruit part of it. I hope, I hope. It's been planted since April. You're like, Fingers come on, crossed. Here we go. <laughs> My growing season's not that long. <laughs> so what has the grow season this year been like for you? Uh, we had a wet spring due to that. We cannot touch our grounds because it's clay loam is the soil type we're dealing with. So we'll turn it to brick. You can actually walk on the soil and your boots will gather it up like a snowball. Wow. That's how our soil acts. And it's red. So we do not touch our fields when it rains, and we had a wet spring. So we have to wait for it to dry for two days, and then we can work the soil. And by that time, it rained again. Huh. So we're three weeks behind, but this rain that comes with Ernesto, hopefully we'll catch things up. All right. Plants have a funny way of doing that. All right. Right on. Well, three weeks behind, but to catch up, here we go. It's going to catch up. Matt, tell us about, because there's a family connection, and then you, you've got Heritage Farm. Uh, talk to us about your involvement with farming. Yeah, so uh, much like Chris, uh, I was also born and raised on a, on a sheep farm. And I think you'll see that theme with a lot of young producers. Yep. Uh, not to say that you can't break in without a family tie, but seems to be generally uh, a sibling will carry on that legacy, so to speak. So uh, I am a fourth generation sheep farmer here on the island and we manage a, f a breeding flock of about 50 to 60, say a commercial flock of yos and then lambs and supplement lambs. Um, we don't have quite as much acreage as Christel, although uh, we certainly would like to. Uh, but we, we manage in terms of hay ground about, I don't know, 20 or 25 acres. And then we pasture uh, animals in the, in the summers to uh, give us an opportunity to grow the hay on the same pastures mm. that they're grazing in the fall so that the land is, say, double use. Mm. Yeah. So what are things like this year for you? Uh, it's been a reasonably good season for yeah. sheep. Sheep have different, uh, you know, look for different things than plants and they're, veg. They're not purple cauliflower, They're not no. purple cauliflower. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they, they do enjoy the cool rain. Uh just these last few weeks where it's been a bit hot, they haven't really enjoyed that, as you can imagine, wool, mm. wool coat and all. But, uh, but they've been doing reasonably well. Um, lambs are getting into good condition, and uh, you know, it, we'll soon start our processing season, say, in late September. What does it mean to you to be fourth generation? I mean, that's, a, it's, that's a lot. Uh, it's cool. Yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, and it's not just my, my media line house. I have uncles and, and cousins involved in yeah, yeah. capacity in, in their you know, respective sheep farms. But uh, I didn't feel obligated to continue, but I, I, I do genu genuinely uh, enjoy sheep farming and farming in any aspect. Uh, it's pretty cool to be able to carry on that uh, tradition though, all the same. Yeah, to think of, because, I mean, to go back, like, what... So four four generations ago, like what years are we talking here? Yeah, well, you're talking over over a hundred years, yeah. and uh, and I mean, I guess it depends in what capacity you define farming. As a lot of people, hundred years ago, farmed for themselves, much as Chris's father did for them. Yeah. Um, so my grandfather would have been the first, say, commercial sheep mm. farmer that would have been three generations ago, and uh, but before that, everyone had a few sheep in the garden. You know, everyone had. A half a dozen hens and a new flying pony and a basic vegetable garden like it was sus substance farming instead of commercial and uh, you're seeing a rise in that as well after covid i think uh, you're seeing a lot more homesteading a lot more people taking an interest in small scale farming you don't have to dive in with 500 acres i mean you can stare it on your little plot of land and See if you enjoy it. Oh, hey, we started with an, a herb garden uh, this year. <laughs> so, you know, like real small, like yeah. a little thing in the patio. But baby steps into it. So we, we heard about what you do, um, how the season's going. And I, we could probably do like multiple shows on this next question. But like <laughs> what are the challenges for farming <laughs> in Newfoundland and Labrador? Uh, and like for when we were up in uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay there in November and we're talking to some farmers, you know, one of the big things was like uh, you know, the equipment cost, right, for Labrador and getting it in. And I'm assuming it's the same on the island. But what else, uh, what are the challenges that you, you folks run into? Well, I would say right now off the top, you're going to have a, the largest challenge would be Mother Nature. Yeah. But you can't fight with that one. <laughs> you can make accommodations by 
starting everything in a greenhouse and heating that, but other than you can't. Um, so the next would be input costs yeah. on every aspect. We pay retail both ways. Mm. We're going to pay retail for the bags that we're buying. We're not getting it wholesale. Mm. And then you pay retail to ship it. So we always pay retail both ways. That's hard. So that cuts into it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Ten cents from every pound that we produce comes to us. Ten cents for every pound goes to you. Wow. High input costs. Yeah. The cost of fuel is not helping. No. Uh, the propane, the heat, the greenhouse in April. We're going, like, I think it was $20 a day to heat the greenhouses. Mm. I mean, you're doing that for a month and a half before it's warm enough. Yeah, that's a high input cost. The seeds. I even subscribe to the vegetable transplant program that's put off by our government, which is a fantastic program where we can produce more. I'm producing five extra acres this year because the vegetables we purchase from them mm. – at a subsidized rate, which is beautiful, I still bought like $3,000 worth of seed. And our seed companies now have reduced the quantity of seeds and increased the price. A little bit of shrinkflation going yes, on there, there. Hey? Yeah. Yeah. So fewer seeds in a pack, but it costs right. more. So I, I need 20000 of this type of cabbage seed. It's $134. Now they're putting 1,000 seeds in it. For one hundred and thirty-four dollars. Oh, right. Yeah. How do you keep planning ahead and, and pushing ahead when like the the margin is that tight? Like if it's ten cents, then but all of a sudden like the seed issue comes up or like a, a piece of equipment breaks down or whatever else. I'm using so what I'm doing. I'm I test our soil every year. Mm -hmm. And I see what our soil actually needs because the other largest input cost would be your soil amendments. Yeah. And so when I'm testing the soil, I'm saying, okay, what do you actually need? And I know what a plant's going to take out of you. I know what we planted the year before. And in our crop rotation, I will do complementary things. Like I know turnip fixes the nitrogen in the soil, so that helps me with our, our field planning. And it's really nutrient management is what helps cut our costs. Yeah. Understanding the land, what plants need to grow, and how to responsibly do this in order to keep things growing as they should grow. Yeah. I want our soil left better than when I found it. Hmm. Matt, what about yourself? What, what challenges are there? Uh -huh. uh, sheep aren't immune to shrinkflation either. No. I mean, yeah. uh, uh, naturally, the, the input costs uh, are constantly growing, so that is a fairly big factor. As Chris, Chris mentioned, we're, we're an island. And getting stuff here is expensive. That's the unfortunate reality. So uh, grain costs here are, are significantly more than they would be on the mainland. And as a result, the product has to be more expensive to compensate for that. Um, the other, I guess, big one for sheep would be uh, predation, an increasing issue in the last, say, 15, 20 years. Uh, coyotes hmm. have... Uh, decimated a lot of uh, flocks across the island, unfortunately. And, and you've actually seen a lot of small and medium-sized firms uh, exit the industry entirely, which is sad. But uh, but it's a real problem. And uh, I actually wear my other hat. I, I sit on the board with the sheep producers in Newfoundland, and, and we're taking some steps maybe to uh, mitigate the loss for coyotes for farmers. We have uh, some meetings coming up in the next month or so. So... We'll see what we can do, but uh, there are challenges, no doubt. But to me, those are the two big ones for sheep, uh, yeah. predation and, and input costs. So what can be done around the predation? What would those conversations be like? Uh, there's a number of different uh, approaches, I guess. Yeah. Um, there, we have some key stakeholders in our planned meeting, but uh, right now there's a, there's a bounty on coyotes in Newfoundland. Yeah. Maybe we're looking to maybe increase that bounty or extend the hunting season or something along those lines. Uh but, you know, I don't think the plan is to eradicate them. I don't think mm -hmm. that's going to be an option, unfortunately, but maybe just to, to keep them at bay, right? 
You're listening to The Signal. I'm Adam Walsh. Today it is a farming conversation, a conversation about young farmers across the province, uh, how they got into the profession, how it's going, how to grow their ranks, because underlying all of that, it's a food security discussion for Newfoundland and Labrador. As you're listening to us, if you have thoughts for us, the signal at cbc.ca is the email, or you can call the signal line and leave a message, 709-576-5260. You can also text us. The text line is 709-327-8206. I've uh, got a couple guests here in studio, uh, Krista Chapman from uh, Three Mile Ridge uh, and uh, Matt Morey, Heritage Farm. Krista is also a mentor, right? I am. Why? Because somebody got to grow food that I want to eat when I'm not growing it. <laughs> That's it, though, isn't it, right? Like, yeah. you know, in order to grow food, we got to grow farmers to grow the food. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's that simple. Yeah. And if we're not growing farmers, the food's not going to be grown. That's a problem. That's a big problem. Yeah. Especially like, yeah, because we can't always rely on stuff coming in from boxes from the mainland nope. because there could be problems with that. Yeah. Yeah. What, when did you make that decision? Early on. Yeah. Uh, when I started farming in 2007, hmm. I noticed that a lot of kids even didn't know re- rightfully where their food came from. So I was part with my children of this group, the drop-in group, with the Vista Family Resource Center at home. Mm. Fantastic organization, and I love the people in it. I invited the kids in that program, which is ages zero to five, to come to the farm and harvest their own vegetables. And it was an experience that they enjoyed, and some of the parents actually said afterwards that when the child got home, they actually wanted to eat it because they harvested it themselves. Huh. So, and it was because a lot of kids would say, oh, it comes from the store, when I would speak to them about the food they are eating. When it doesn't, a farmer somewhere grew what you're eating. Yeah. Right? Yeah, food doesn't come from the store. No. Right? <laughs> like, it gets brought there. Yes. And you buy it there. Yes. Huh. But somewhere, some farm, some farmer produced what you're eating, no matter what it is. And I wanted to change that for the children of our area. And then it started growing to, besides educating about our food sources, growing other farmers. Like if kids were interested in it, I would like to encourage that mm. and say, you know, you just got to plant the seed. So I developed a program through our farmer's market in Clarenville called the Happy Carrots Program. Oh, that's a great name. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> and it... Uh, helps kids understand where their food comes from. We, The program had three elements. It was growing, it was harvesting, and then preparing food. Mm. So we taught them how to cook it and what you could do with it. So eating healthy was a big thing, and then they could go and play, and we had different activities. So all of it rolled into one. We've done lots of shows talking about the social determinants of health, and I, I find just this conversation as well. You can see a connection, right? If you have people getting connected to their food early on, knowing where it comes from, knowing the health around it, down the road, social determinants type things and our health outcomes for folks, this is part of that. Yeah. And then I had a lot of like adults or like uh, coming to me asking, you know, how did you get into farming? Well, I was very lucky. Mm -hmm. I was very lucky that out my back door there was 81 acres. A lot of people are not so lucky. Uh, but they can still farm, no matter what size. They can still grow their own food and produce it in some way and probably produce enough to sell. And on that aspect, I started helping out others locally that Mm. wanted to get into farming, get into farming. So then uh, we're about to talk to a farmer you're mentoring, right, John? Because you're mentoring Jonathan, right? Yeah, I am. Tell me, before we talk to Jonathan, tell us about Jonathan. (laughs) Jonathan's awesome. (laughs) He's, He's... he really wants to farm. He really wants to produce his own food. He's a quick learner. He's like a sponge absorbing every single bit of information. And he's he's actively doing this. He's going to do it. Jonathan Holloway is on the line, Mosquito Cove Farm, Lethbridge. Hi, Jonathan. Hi, Adam. How are you? Good. Thanks for coming on the show. Uh, why farming? Well, I don't know, really. <laughs> It started for me years ago as a kid working local farms here, but uh, I came back home from the mainland and I hooked up with a girl and her grandfather passed. And he had a bunch of land to farm that he used to farm, so sort of slipped right into it. What 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 were you doing on the mainland? I was drilling and truck driving and all kinds of stuff. 
All right, so drilling and truck driving, but you come back and then uh, the you know the new situation with relationship and the family situation, all that. Next thing you know, there's some land there, but like. If that were me, I would still never, ever be able to farm, right? Like it just it, it takes a specific type of or a certain kind of person to really get into it. What was the first kind of foray like into this as you're like, you know what? I'm going to give this a shot. Like, were you nervous? What was like the first like for a couple of weeks or first grow season like? Oh, I was definitely nervous. I still am. I'm still afraid to plant a big crop because I'm afraid it's all going to get killed by some sort of pest. <laughs> mm. But um, I don't know. When I moved here, the, the garden is the the grounds were already plowed. There was vegetables planted there the year before. And so it was sort of an opportunity that really caught my attention. And I loved to grow my own vegetables and never have room to do it. And yeah, it was just an opportunity that I couldn't, couldn't resist. It's too tempting. So what have you been growing? Uh, like what are you growing this grow season? I've got uh, watermelons and cantaloupes. I've got carrots and potatoes and cabbage and, Lettuce and corn, and beets, squash, um, pumpkins. <laughs> Quite the variety. Uh, yeah, a little bit of everything. <laughs> mm. I, I, I'll, I'll be honest, I did avoid some of the ones with the, that the pests really get into because they're more difficult and I'm not certified for pesticides yet, which is coming in the near future. But I try to avoid using pesticides at all costs because it's expensive and people don't like it. Yeah, yeah. What what's it been like being a mentee, right? What's it been like uh, learning from Krista? Oh, it's great. Whatever, I wouldn't be near where I'm at. And not only is Krista my as <laughs> my mentor, she, I've known Krista for a long time, so I've been reaching out to Krista for help for a long time. <laughs> so without her, I don't know where I'd be. I I wouldn't have a clue. I, I've obtained so much information about correcting the pH level in the soil and fertilizing and different pests. There's a never-ending line of information. <laughs> so the, I love the sounds in the background. <laughs> it was, this is very <laughs> on point for a farming show. Uh, like Because I could have had sound effects, but uh, the real thing is uh, far, far the real thing uh, is better. better. Yeah. <laughs> What, so the, for others who might be thinking about farming, what do you think about where we are right now in 2024 if folks are thinking about getting into farming in Newfoundland and Labrador? Oh, I think give her. It'd be crazy not to. And I would encourage anybody that wants to get into farming, reach out for a mentor. They're out there. Krista's not the only one. And it makes it so much easier for you. And join the NL Farmers. Like, NL Farmers, everything you need to know, anything you need, you can access it through NL Farmers. It's there. You need to get uh, the pesticide course. They can set you up. They, mm. Everything you need, they can. Any questions can be answered through NL Farmers, right? So, where would you, looking at where things are now and like the journey you've been on, where do you want things to go for Mosquito Cove Farm? Like, what's the end, like the end goal for you for production and and, and farming? Uh, go bigger. We want to grow more. We're going to hopefully obtain forty acres of land here now by. Hopefully by next spring, we'll be able to start working 40 acres. So if you work 40 acres, what is that for, for a civilian in the farming world? What does that mean for output and what you might be able to grow and sell and, and, uh, and all that? Oh, I could uh, grow half as much as Krista. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it would be a lot for me. I mean, right now I'm working on roughly three acres. Yeah. Okay. And, well, I've got a lot of potatoes planted on probably an acre and a half, if not more of my land, because, well, potatoes, you got to have potatoes, right? <laughs> yes. Excellent. Uh, anything you uh, want to say to Jonathan? Oh, I think he's doing wonderful. Yeah. And I think he will be able to that. produce successfully uh, a lot more food next year once he gets that. And I think what he has produced on his three acres is fantastic. We're hoping to be able to get him up to the farmer's market this fall selling his vegetables. Oh, cool. Which is awesome. Jonathan Holloway, thanks so much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Cheers. Jonathan Holloway there, Mosquito Cove Farm, uh, Lethbridge. And that'll be great at the farmer's market, right? Like just, And to see this progress kind of move along, right, is uh, is really something. I'm... Again, like, you know, so, yes, we talk about it on the show and stuff, but, like, some of the surprising bits to hear, like, cantaloupe and what, like... I think some people might be surprised in what you can you – now Dan Rubin is out there saying, like, Adam, I talk about this on your show every time I'm on. But still, like, I think people will be surprised at what you can grow and what you can do in Newfoundland and Labrador uh, if, like, just with, with, with effort, right? When when did cantaloupe come into to things? 
I, I like cantaloupe. Okay, so that's the reason. <laughs> and I want to eat it. <laughs> and I want to feed my family good food. So the more varieties that I can produce myself, the better off we can be F- from my own family because we like to um, produce and grow and raise everything that we consume yeah. annually. So in the spring of the year, I'm planting a lot of seeds and... In the fall, I'm doing a lot of secondary processing and getting it frozen, bottled, and or put away in cold storage because mm-hmm. we want to last throughout the winter. Yeah, I can go three months without going to a grocery store. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. That's the longest I've been able to go. Three months. So, three okay, months. You think you can push it? I'm gonna try. <laughs> so then, for secondary processing, what do you do? Like what? Like we were bottling. Talking, yeah. So just okay. bottling, freezing, blanching. Yeah, all of that. And then just storing it and then yep. having it for... I have a massive pantry. Like, and I have five deep fridges. Five deep freezes. Yes. Massive pantry. Right. Uh, Matt, what about yourself on it? Because like, I know it's, it's you're not in the veg side of things, but uh, you know on the meat side of it. What's that like for yourself and the philosophy towards like food and, and bringing in for your family and self-sustainment? Yeah, for sure. I mean... Uh... You can't survive on lamb alone. So, no, yeah, so you need a bit more. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't think I can go uh, three months without the trip <laughs> to the grocery store. But uh, no, it's uh, it's great. I mean, similar to Krista, it's, it's grown right here. Mm. Sheep do really well in our climate, unlike a lot of vegetables and fruits where, you know, they wish it was a little bit warmer. The sheep seem to love sheep here. Sheep are fine, huh? Hey? Sheep do extremely well here. Uh, and they do well in rough pasture, which we have lots of. Um, mm. Yeah, they're, they're tailor-made for Newfoundland. What are the characteristics that you think make a good farmer? Like, what does one need? <laughs> uh, you definitely can't be afraid of hard work, uh, and the to to be a farmer, you, you can't just be a farmer anymore. Like, uh, things have changed. You need to be a, a marketing agent. You need to be a mechanic. You need to be a chemist of sorts. Um, you need to wear many, many different hats. So farming is well suited for, you know, the, the jack of all trades or, or that sort of thing. Uh, and you, you need to persevere. <laughs> you, you know, you, you need to look beyond the, the immediate struggle. And, and, you know, naturally with any industry, there's going to be heartbreak and there's going to be bad growing seasons and there's going to be good growing seasons. Mm-hmm. And uh, you need to be able to accept the good with the bad because, unfortunately, we are dealing with the environment, which is... Uh, Becoming more and more volatile year after year, it seems. So, work ethic would be my number one, and willingness to uh, learn would be my number two characteristics for farmers. Krista? This is the thing about farming, though. You get to do it every year. Yeah. You get to try it again and learn from your mistakes from last year. There was one year in 2018, we had $57,000 worth of vegetables freeze solid in the ground. There was no coming back from that. Oh. That was it. So what? Uh, okay, uh, but that so that's a lot of money, and that's a lot just to be kind of frozen in in, in the, the ground, ground. Uh, and no coming back from it. What does that mean then? Start over again the next year, and you swallow that loss. I couldn't recover the cost. How hard is this? I mean, that's a lot. That's, that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That's like so. Like what? When you swallow that loss, how do you kind of move, you get plant again and just how do you slow like how do you so recoup then you probably that? end up going and get a personal loan to buy your input costs from the next year because now you also got to pay off your fertilizer bill, you also got to pay off all of the people that you get stuff from in the yeah. spring of the year and now you're paying them off in the fall, all that money left. <laughs> And it, it, it just sounds so precarious, right? Like, yeah. So, so yeah. like, then you're hoping, well, hopefully this season we don't have that because then yeah. we're in, in trouble so or whatever. So then you learn from that and you're okay. like, okay, I have a date that I want everything off the ground. Yeah. And once it's off the ground, I'm okay. That's a hard way to learn a lesson, though. Like, yeah. you know. It froze solid in October. <laughs> it wasn't only here. Wheat everywhere. All of Canada froze. Are there any extra supports then that could be... Like, fine, that's a one-off type of thing that happens. But it, and you already mentioned, like, a good government program. But is there any extra government support that is not available now or something that's done in other places that you think could help? Or, or is it just kind of like this is the business and this is how it is? I think there is some programming there. Uh, I don't think I'm big enough to avail of it. It's mm. not going to be worth 
my input costs into, say, crop insurance and things like that. Right. Um, but there is programming out there. Okay. There is stuff for some folks. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree with Chris. Uh, like, you can get agri insurance for your for your farm. And depending on your scale, it may or may not be worth your time, same as most insurances. Um, like, for me personally, agri insurance is a good thing, but it doesn't cover predation. Or if it does cover predation, you need to recover you know, the, the lamb or sheep, which is very difficult when the coyote's eating it and, and gone on. Yeah, so, try to recover what's yeah, been eaten, right? So, I mean, so. uh, you know, uh, I mean, there are a lot of programs out there. It's just do they fit your exact scale? You know, that that's a personal decision, of course. But You're listening to The Signal. We're talking about farming for Newfoundland and Labrador with a focus on young farmers and food security. And we're talking about what goes into growing these farmers to grow the food that we consume. And at a time when we talk more and more about food security and the need to grow uh, more of our own. We're going to go to Go- uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay now. Darren Dinsmore is on the line, Aldercroft Farm. How you doing, Darren? Hey, I'm doing well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Tell us about Aldercroft Farm. Yeah, so uh, we went ahead and purchased the farm here in Goose Bay back in 2017. It was a... Uh, growing potatoes and different things like that and we uh, quickly moved it over to more of a beef production where we grow uh, forage for our beef cows what type of, are they highland cows uh, for, for uh, aldercroft yeah that's correct we have uh, mostly highland cows which is what we wanted to start off with just because of our location and uh, lack of vet services and things like that. But we are slowly introducing um, uh, Angus Cross into the mix just to provide more hybrid vigor and uh, and increase our growth rates. What, in the beginning with the Highland cows, why would those ones be the good ones to start with uh, for the region? Well, we had done some research as to what might be a, a good option for us here. And Highland cows... Um, are extremely hardy cows. Um, they're one of the oldest known breeds of cattle in the entire world, and they don't get sick very often. Um, they don't get uh, things like eye infections or different diseases that uh, cattle might pick up. They're just very, very hardy, very resilient, and uh, through uh, you know, living such a long time, they've uh, just adapted to uh, their environment. They've got long coats of share, which help them stay warm in the winter. Um, they have horns, which actually contribute to their immune system. And, uh, yeah, they even have long eyelashes to keep the uh, bugs out of their eyes and different things out of their eyes. They're just very hardy, well-built animals mm. for uh, harsh conditions so that's why we chose them yeah and like you said if there's a if it's hard to get vet services uh you you, hardy animals are a good thing yeah yeah that's what we wanted to start off with Mm -hmm. and the intention was to eventually uh crossbreed them into a more commercially uh viable uh, animal such as a black angus cattle that that just grow a lot faster you're probably looking at uh, cutting your growth time in half with uh with an animal like that. Darren, how did you get into farming, by the way? Uh, We got into farming um, really looking at uh, food security here in Labrador. It became a concern for us uh, a number of years ago. And uh, really, it was a way that we felt we could contribute to our community here and, uh, and really just provide that opportunity to have local meats um, produced here in Labrador, which uh, currently isn't being done. So what else needs to change or uh, for you to kind of keep pushing ahead with your plan here? What else do you need to be successful uh, for your farm? Um, well, I think any farm, um, including the ones on the island, what we need to do is we need um, more available local infrastructure, such as uh, storage like vegetable storage or meat storage. And we also need processing facilities and value-added facilities uh, in the area that farmers can use and uh, avail of so that they can get their products to market. Um, The second big thing we need in uh, Newfoundland Labrador would be uh, to 
produce more local inputs. And those inputs would be things like uh, producing our own seed, producing our own uh, livestock, and also producing our own things like uh, fertilizer and manure. We need to be doing those locally so that we can um, decrease the cost of our inputs into the farm. So what has to change in order to get that to happen? Is it just getting more people into the industry, or what is it? Uh, Yeah, I think more people into the industry, but also um, coming at it with a plan. I think sometimes in farming, uh, we do ourselves an injustice by um, just continuing to buy the same things we've always bought. And, you know, the same expensive bag of fertilizer or the same expensive bag of feed from out of province, because that's what we've always done. And I think if we really came together and made a plan as to how we could strategically produce local inputters, um, we could really see some great progress forward. Um, and that just comes with like deciding, okay, you know, hey, the, the guy that produces livestock, he's going to, you know, try to make his uh, manure available for the vegetable farmers. And, mm. you know, maybe a vegetable farmer could help uh, produce uh, grain or corn that the livestock farmers could utilize, right, for their livestock. It's all about working together and really coming up with a plan instead of just doing what we've always done. And it's it's hard because as a farmer, I mean, we work hard, right? And you need to, sometimes you need to sort of step back and assess the situation instead of just continuing to, you know, pay the feed bill or pay the fertilizer bill, um, you know, because that's what you've always done, right? Mm. Darren, yeah. Darren Dinsworth, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for uh Hearing me out. All right. Cheers. Darren Dinsmore there, uh, Aldercroft Farm, uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay. I will go back to my guests here in studio. We've got uh, Krista Chapman, uh, Three Mile Ridge, uh, as well as Matt Morey, Heritage Farm. Thoughts on what he was saying? I think it's a fantastic idea. (laughs) Excellent. (laughs) I love it. Yeah. Why? Well, one, it invites collaboration with everybody and increases our everything. It It will give some strength. To our industry, if we're producing our own seed, if we have our own sources of fertilizer, it will give a lot of strength to us, and especially the secondary processing. Mm. We used to produce our own chickens, turkeys, ducks, and geese, and we had to ship them in the nighttime in here to town for us to find a licensed facility when we can sell our product after we had raised it. The cost of that. So we'd work all day. A lot. Yeah. We'd work all day, and then we'd take all of our birds, we could do 50 at a time, and we'd load them into our truck in a trailer, proper crates, yeah. all that expense. And then we'd travel in here, which is two and a half hours for us, and we'd take it easy with the trailer in tow, and all of the birds would be roosting so they're good and they're comfy. Mm-hmm. And we'd drop our trailer, make sure everything was okay, come back the next day in the night, drop more birds, pick up the ones that were processed the night before. And we would do this for a full week to get through, and sometimes longer. But that's late nights. We're working on our farm all day, and we're getting home 3 a.m. There's many naps I took in the truck in Whipper. So what would make, how do you change that scenario? Another processing facility, more more processing facilities. Somebody to develop that would be fantastic. What's preventing that from happening? Like, is it hard to like start up a processing facility? I'd say the input cost would be substantial. Yeah. A building, certified equipment, all of that. Yeah, provincial inspected laboratories do involve a lot of capital for sure. Yeah. No, I think uh, Darren made some good points there about input costs and uh, having things on the island to decrease those costs. I mean, for me, feed, yeah. the same sack of feed, it's $32 here, is 11 in Ontario. It's the exact same sack of feed, just had to get from Ontario to Newfoundland. So, so wait, you could say the cost difference again for feed? It's, it's about 3x. It's about three times the so, cost. Yeah, so for feed here, it's three times more than folks pay in Ontario. Right. Right. You know, as a general rule, I guess. R- r- yeah, roughly, know. yeah, give or take, uh, right? So, you know, as a result, you know, the, the products produced here, need to reflect that unfortunately i mean you're in the business to to make profit so uh, 
you know, a $30 sack of feed, uh, you know, your meat or your product or whatever reflects that, unfortunately. And, and a lot of people, you know, don't quite understand the food chain here necessarily and say, well, I can get it at, you know, X store for, for this. And, and no doubt you can. It's just that the input cost here is not, it's not gouging by any stretch. It's just no, that no. It, it is that high mm. here for, for a lot of, for a lot of items. Right. So. Before we got out of the birds, we were producing, uh, it cost us $8 per pound to produce the meat. $8 per pound to produce. Yeah. And when was this, what year? Um, Pre-COVID. Yeah, so. So 2019. So imagine the Last cost year now. we did it. I can't imagine. No, we got out of it just as we could see the feed prices rising and we were paying $21 a sack then. And by the time we stopped, we were like, okay, now it's like. Thirty-five dollars a sack. We can't. No. So, how does this make us feel about the future of farming? When, like we were talking, it's three times for the feed. So, so there's, we have the Darren conversation saying we need to talk more. We need to come up with plans to see who can do what. So, whose manure can go for whose uh, vegetable crops? Where can can we grow our own feed? So, there's all these things, but those things aren't necessarily happening just yet. So how do we push things forward to keep these conversations going and to start filling in these holes and actually really make us able to be self, like, have self-sustainment? Farmers. So we need more farmers. We need people to be able to produce the inputs. More interest. Yep. And how do we do that? Advocating. Shows so like this. talking on the radio like we are today. Okay, that's one way. Yeah. yeah. Any other, any other thoughts? I mean, uh, a lot of uh, I assume a lot of people uh, that are interested in farming, maybe not involved, think you need millions and millions in capital to start, and therefore I'm not going to bother. But as Krista, Krista alluded to earlier, I mean, start with what you have. Like, see if you even like farm. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. you don't need to go out and buy a hundred acre farm to start. I mm-hmm. mean, get five sheep. See if you like sheep or maybe you hate Chickens. sheep and you get into poultry. I mean, poultry is... Chicken math is a thing. It's mm-hmm. a thing. Yeah. Since COVID, I mean, uh, homesteading and, and specifically, you know, egg-laying chickens have become extremely popular here, at least in my circle. Mm-hmm. And, Ours uh, too. Yeah. And the eggs are so... Oh, they're so good. No doubt. Nice deep orange yolks. Let's go. We've got Mark Hoff back on the line, Outreach Coordinator, NL Young Farmers. Hi. Hi, Adam. As we wrap up, any any uh, closing thoughts on your end today of uh, just from the conversation we've had uh, and, and just a look ahead for uh, growing more farmers and getting more young farmers in and staying into the industry? Yeah, well, uh, one of the great things about my job is that we get to not only advocate for farmers and help farmers get into the industry, but we learn from farmers. So, like, conversations like this are vital so that we can gain the information directly from farmers that we need so we can provide the proper programs and uh, workshops and training sessions. So I have a, I just made a note about the inputs and whatnot. So, you know, uh, that's one important thing that we have to keep an eye on. Uh, and I encourage anybody else out there listening or anybody who knows anybody who wants to get into farming to visit our website because uh, membership for NL Young Farmers is free. So then you can uh, you can uh, sign up by the website, just fill out an application form. It's uh, nlyoungfarmers.ca. Uh, uh, and you can also find the information for our uh, upcoming summit on there. The agenda and the registration form are also on our website. So we hope to see some new faces in October at the summit and some familiar faces as well. Mark Hoff, thank you so much. Thank you. Mark Hoff there, Outreach Coordinator, NL Young Farmers. Uh, we've got an extra call in here. Dick Whitaker's on the line. Uh, hi, Mr. Whitaker. How you doing? Oh, very good. Yeah, I've been there, done some of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, I just got an idea for some of the uh, people who are looking into animal stuff. Um, they should have a hard look at the root crops. You know, uh, turnips you can be grazed uh, t- twice, and then the turnips themselves harvest. You know, later on for winter feed and all this kind of stuff. You know, it requires some thinking about it, but they grow fast and uh, so on. And if you use an electric fence to, uh, you know, to control the grazing of them, just a simple electric wire will do it. And, mm. uh, um, you know, you can cut the cost of your feed down quite a lot. And the more you can go into the fall and winter with this sort of thing, 
the less of the other feed you need, you know. And, and by the way, the protein content of turnips are pretty damned high. Mm. Mm. Excellent point. So, so uh, and there are other options like oats and so on. So uh, I think people are going to have to do that here because the, the, they're quite right, the cost of feed is, is limiting and uh, so high. The other point I would like, I wish people would stop moaning and groaning about the price of food. Um, the, the, you know, it's now um, probably around 10% of family income is pay, spent on food. I'll bet you 20 is on cars. And uh, historically, around the end of the war, it was around 40% of family income was spent on food. So they're getting a damn good deal. Excellent. Yeah, that's enough. <laughs> hey, no, I appreciate the points as always. Thank you so much. Right on. Bye-bye. All right, Dick Whitaker there. Yeah, there you go. All right. And, and it, it's time, true. It's true, and times yeah. change. Like, we produce a vegetable hamper that can feed a family of four to six for $15. $15. Right. So you get your vegetable hamper. Vegetable hamper. Yeah. Four to six family. Four to six people will eat from that. Right? That's a pretty good price. Yeah. Right. Dick makes some good points. And, well, I know Dick separately is a friend of the family, but yeah. uh, um, rotational grazing is important for yeah. livestock. Uh, and again, the days of the, of the dumb farmer are dead. Uh, mm. You need to be with the times now, and uh, rotational grazing is where it's at. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of great programs out there, subsidies, RALP and SCAP and PAP. And anyone that's into farming knows what I'm referring to. But, uh, you know, uh, there's lots of opportunities out there to you know use that on your farm and same with uh, you know turnips I've, I've heard of that before and mm -hmm. something that we've explored but uh, yeah it's all thoughts uh, Matt Moore and Krista Chapman thank you so much for coming in for this farming discussion today I appreciate it thank you thank you all right folks that's it for uh, this Monday show uh, tomorrow Tuesday gardening day that means uh, Michael Murray from Murray's Gardens in Portugal Cove, St. Phillips, will be by. We're talking fall planting and harvesting. So, I mean, it's kind of a farming show tomorrow as well. Taking us out today. Oh, I just, if you've got thoughts on today's show before I say taking us out, uh, call the signal line and leave a message. Or for any show, 709 576 5260. Emails the signal at cbc.ca. We love suggestions. Uh, we love your input. Thank you so much for always uh, for, for listening and for all the feedback you give us.